here is a security session and uh, we'll talk apparently about cybersecurity and all things related to that. So the plan for today, uh, this session is a general session of interest related to security, privacy, and other topics. And uh, we'll talk about why security is important or not, uh, what should we do, and about very, very common misconceptions in the security area. And the second session is a more technical deep dive, which will happen in a couple of hours from now. And we will go to a different room and talk more specifically about DHS2 hardening and about uh, answer your questions, some feedback, and uh, we'll look in more specific details on implementations and how security DHS2 work together and uh, how we can make uh, our systems more compliant, more safe, and uh, robust, depending on your use case. A couple of words about myself. I'm working with cybersecurity for more than 20 years and uh, did a lot of stuff, including security auditing, penetration testing, compliance, uh, privacy, uh, various ap application security engineering, teaching students, and other things. Uh, I've been working with DHS2 for two years and uh, based out of Oslo, Norway. And uh, to make this session a bit more interactive, I have a backlog of questions. It's a literally a Google document that you, you can access it by this link, either the QR code or the link security dhs2.org slash ask. And you can write your questions there or feedback or comments uh, as, as uh, the whole, as all the road as I speak. So, and uh, either we will pick up uh, the interesting questions and discuss them in the orders here. Either I can provide the answers after after the meeting in the document itself, and it can be used for future reference for other things. And we can do some discussion about all the second session as well. So feel free to share your comments. Uh, you can write your name or email if you'd like to, or we can stay anonymous. So it's uh, totally up to you, but uh, it's important to get feedback for us and maybe it's more handy than to uh, ask uh, questions during, during, the, during the session. Uh, so, uh, to begin with the main topic, um, the idea of uh, talking of cybersecurity here came from two different situations. The first one is once people come to us and say, oh, we would like to do security properly and we don't know how to start with it. Or we bought a very, very expensive security device, a firewall or something, and it didn't help. What should we do? This is one station. And another one is when we meet our implementers and they say, oh, we just had a security incident and uh, the system is not working. People can't use the HS2 and we don't know what's happening. And we're some, always somewhere in between two situations when we would like to do something really cool and do everything properly. And uh, sometimes it's too early because we are. it's hard to navigate and to understand what's actually we need to do. And the second is when it's a bit late and when, oh, we are in the crisis now and we need to help our implementers to resolve the issues. So we'll talk about what's happening in between and how to approach security properly because in the world of consulting, in the world of what we hear and listen, there are a lot of different uh, ideas and trends, and security is not the easiest domain to understand and to get to. It will try to uh, untie all you know, the stories, the important stories here, and talk about it a, a bit more in detail. And the uh, very practical question, uh, how would you define a risk? Do you have any ready definitions or anything to share? Okay, uh, typically it's uh, 
once I ask this question and someone has a ready answer, there are like 10, 15 different definitions of risk. And uh, it's, and I think in the previous presentation, Bernard talked something about risks and uh, he definitely had some meaning. And when I talk about risk, there's also a kind of definition of that. And uh, there is a general one that was quite or recently uh, adopted by the ISO organization. And it is as simple as that. Risk is an effect of uncertainty on objectives. It comes from the standard. And uh, in certain cases, uh, it is important to understand that can, there can be different mean interpretations or different means of that. But in general, it's an effect of uncertainty of, on objectives. So important takeaways from this very, very short definition, which may be not very familiar or common to everyone, is that it can be either negative or po positive. So the risk, uh, including security risk, of course, can be either a disaster or it can be also an opportunity, something that can help us. So it's not always negative. Risk is always connected to the context, to the goals or objectives of the organization. And it's also related to the uncertainty or likelihood of the event that may or may not happen. And in order to talk about security risks and to plan and to implement our security response properly, we need to start with a very, very high level risk management exercise to understand what is really important for organization and how to deal with that. And the first exercise that we'll do is kind of looking into the what are our objectives. Um, if we had a workshop, we would do it in like in groups or other things. But now you can, as a like personal exercise, you can try writing down as as I talk. You can try writing down the main goals of your organization, and you can try to see if you have enough protection against the risks. And you don't need to share it with anyone, but it's a good kind of a mental exercise for yourself to see. Oh, I'm working for the public health institution, or I'm working for NGO, uh, or I'm working for the private company. And these are the organization's objectives, the goals. Is there anything related to cybersecurity that can happen and can damage the reach or impact delivery or impact uh, reaching these goals? So, Typically, there are like really a couple of things that are the main, the principal objectives of the organization and uh, understanding the potential risk effect of them is the second thing. So once we write what's the most important, the values, the processes, it may be the kind of the core activities, then we try to think, okay, this is what we do uh, and here is the potential risk. The third one is we try to assess the likelihood of what bad can happen, and then we create an action plan. So it can be a mental exercise, and we'll try to go through different steps. And uh, once you come back home, I suggest doing this exercise with your teams. And if you do it now, we can discuss it during the next meeting or uh, outside of the uh, sessions, because um, in the many, many of the cases, people start implementing security measures uh, or without like making this kind of exercise or vice versa. They haven't done that and they face the real risks before like re recapping what the objectives are. Let's uh, take, to make it a bit more easy, let's look at the point of view of the defender or the organization that is being attacked. So what bad actually can happen? So the most immediate is it's a failure to provide a public service. It can be a violation of the law, for example, in the case of, of privacy data leaks, where the, the 
citizens uh, or employee information becomes publicly exposed. In some cases, it might be a direct financial loss. Uh, it might be a reputational damage and maybe something else. Um, do you have any like examples of what is um, important or what bad can happen to your organizations? Is there anything missing on this list that is like the important for 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 your teams? Yes, please. I mean, uh, data security. Uh, if my data is secure, uh, you have uh, yeah, uh, user level information. Mm -hmm. You need to secure that. So, and you need to see that uh, your data is secured. Um, I guess uh, DHS do do provide end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, but uh, I mean, there are other security threats as well. So you need to uh, look around that as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, so if uh, you've mentioned encryption, and uh, encryption is uh, treated as one of the like solid protection measures, but how do we make sure that encryption works in this case? So uh, it is a very common idea. Okay, every product should have a lot of security features, but using them properly is also a kind of a art and a kind of knowledge and skill. That's why we typically should ensure that we select and implement these measures properly based on the goals of the organization. So yeah, it's true. Um, so from the practical experience, um, if we look at the history of security incidents in the last two, three years globally, um, for the private sector, clearly the biggest threat is a financial loss. Because once the organization loses money, uh, it breaks a business model. And uh, I think the most of the organizations that suffer, it's banks, insurance companies, all kind of uh, services that uh, retail services where you have some material assets. But uh, this is not our case. What are the biggest threats that impact the public sector or NGOs or the organizations that don't have any immediate um, financial assets that are attractive to attackers. Um, it's often mentioned, and I think it's the kind of a last resort, uh, last resort uh, threat that it is a reputational damage. So it's often believed that the reputation is something that is very important. And if you have a security incident, it, it, it can, can be recovered and there is a significant loss. Um, the practice shows that in reality, it is not always true. So reputation is extremely important, but uh, it's about handling the PR response. So it means that as we proceed in time, and if we handle the response properly, um, it's not a big problem and the organization can recover from that. So, and one important thing to consider is, okay, uh, we need to have someone to respond to the incident and to manage our public communication in crisis to do things. And I think we're generally covered. There were, if you heard about major security breaches of the last two, three, five, 10 years, all the organizations that suffered from these breaches, they survived, they continued operating, nothing happened to them. They had a lot of problems, but they were not existential problems. They did not stop, they didn't prevent them from working further. So it looks like it's a problem, but not a major one. Uh, for the public sector, I think the, like I've been talking to different people and I've heard I think there are two bigger problems. One is a legal non-compliance and the violation of the law for institutions that should support, should support and 
uh, demonstrate a good example of following the law. And uh, I think all kind of a non-privacy, non-compliance, technical non-compliance, uh, data governance non-compliance is a real effect which can lead to the uh, court claims, can lead to the uh, different issues related to the uh, general national data security and other things. So I think that um, if we look at the security from the compliance perspective, uh, following the compliance requ requirements is ex extremely important. And if something is not in place, it means that we should pay quite a lot of attention to that because it kind of undermines any security issue, undermines the whole legal structure, the whole legal approach for the organization. Um, in the next session, we'll talk a bit what kind of compliance requirement can be implemented in DHS2, what do we support, what is outside of the DH of DHS2 as a product, and uh, as compliance is used as kind of an extra burden to any organization, I think that our like mutual goal is to make it as efficient as possible. So like the best winning organization is uh, that the one that can introduce and implement compliance in the like in the in the most lightweight and the most easy way. And this is what we're aiming for. And um, another thing is uh, like we're going from bottom a bit to the top is uh, failure to provide public service. So uh, if the government or the public function is not working properly, and it typically impacts a lot of internal KPIs or a lot of um, like in organizational uh, policies. Uh, so typically if something stops working, it's a problem because uh, the citizens can't get uh, the service, uh, data is not available and all kinds of the operational issues. So this, these are the most typical things that are at risk and means that the investment or the money that was spent on the organization to make it work, it it it, it is kind of wasted. And uh, the instrument, the tool is not working properly. So I think these two are the biggest one. And uh, if you have any feedback and comments on that, let's discuss it later. Um, now let's look on the attacker's point of view. So how attackers see the same story what's important for the attackers, because once we understand what they're lo actually looking for, why do they attack our systems? Um, it makes our task for protection much easier. Um, all that, that I'm talking about is based on the experience that were reported by the HS2 users. And uh, these were like re real life cases of what happened and they're supported by any other product in the industry. So from the attacker's perspective, uh, the main interest is typically a kind of a financial interest, uh, no surprise. So people are interested in getting something, something for free in, in order to be able to either resell, either to Use for any kind of a malicious purpose and get some like monetary gain on, on that. Um, the most typical thing is, uh, okay, we have installed DHS2 on a brand new server. And uh, in a couple of months, nobody was checking what's going on on the server infrastructure there. And uh, we noticed that the server is all outloaded, uh, overloaded. There is a abnormal high system utilization and we don't know what's happening. Uh, we're running the latest DHS2 version, but uh, we don't know what's in the, in the server environment. Then we help the team to understand what's going on and uh, see that there is a crypto mining tool consuming all resources and uh, trying to mine cryptocurrencies in the, in the somewhere in the, in the background. And uh, from our perspective, it's a very strange use case. So people got into this, some people got into the system not for stealing our data, but just for using our computing power. Uh, but it's a security breach, it's a violation, uh, our users can't work, and there is someone who, should not, who is not authorized, who is sitting in the system and doing some bad stuff. Um, for 
people, the motivation for people who do this kind of security uh, attacks is just to get some extra CPU power or create a botnet or just proxy traffic to some other servers as a like, uh, platform for, for the attacking. Um, this is a very, very typical example. And we typically ask why, and we say it just because it's a free, free, free resource that can be hacked. Second thing is selling user accounts and personal data. Um, if we, it, it's mostly related to again to banking institutions or kind of high profile accounts or high value accounts. But on the black market, if you get personal data of someone, they can be sold roughly from. 10 cents in US, in US dollars or like 10, 50 cents to five, 10 dollars per account. So depending on how many user accounts you are able to mine, to collect and to hack, including personal data, emails, phone numbers, social security numbers, whatever, uh, depending on the country where these people originate, you can curate and create a, and sell a database of this account and get some extra money. So this is kind of a profitable business. And then these databases of User data are used for uh, spamming. They're used for different social engineering attacks. And they, like this aggregated and curated arrays of data, they have some certain value in the criminal market in the dark web. Um, and uh, if you, by any chance, have access to dark web, you can just see the marketplaces where different databases are sold. And they have very, very specific and clear monetary value. But if you have roughly a thousand of users or thousand of the records it it can be worth from like fifty dollars to uh, uh, hundreds or maybe thousands of dollars so this this is a clear financial motivation um the third case is um, i would on one side i would say very exotic uh, on the other side it is increasingly common nowadays it uh, is related to the targeted interest in your systems. And uh, this is probably an attack that you will not uh, even notice. It's related to APT actors or advanced persistent threats. So these are uh, on purpose hackers that are looking for data or for information in, in different systems. We know that uh, all kinds of the uh, state uh, hacker groups, uh, state, state control hacker groups, they combat in cyberspace. And by some case, uh, your systems can be also the target if uh, they consider that your data is valuable. Uh, to make this assessment, uh, you need to be like uh, quite or ju justification for accessing this data. You need to have very specific interest and very specific purpose. And uh, we know the examples of like data being collected. Uh, kind of randomly, but uh, then analyzed and processed, not in the case of the HS2, but in the case of the, the, case of the other uh, popular data leaks that happened in the in joint uh, public sector in the last five, 10 years. And uh, typically it can be the case getting the voting database of the whole country. If uh, there were some cases when the whole uh, population register of one Asian country leaked like two years ago, and the same was in uh, South America, as I recall. So there are quite a lot of well-known examples of that. And uh, I think this data was some kind of uh, processed and uh, released to the public for a specific purpose. And uh, uh, the fourth case is uh, script kiddies. It's uh, all kind of uh, random stuff happening on internet, young uh, geniuses, students, or other people who would like to try new brand security tools or regular internet noise, automated scanners, or whatever. Uh, it can impact uh, your systems even if you don't mm, think about this. All right, so it's a regular internet noise that happens all the time. Um, to give a kind of a understanding of how polluted uh, internet is, uh, for example, if you take a brand new computer connected to the internet on the public address, uh, someone tries to connect to it within 30 to 50 minutes uh, with some kind of security attack. So 
it's the internet space is scanned and assessed all the time by multiple parties and it's a part of the regular like noise that happens there and these kinds of attack may be quite harmful and they can be quite harmless uh, it, it's really hard to hard to, hard to predict um what's what could go wrong right so what are the typical problems that happen and that everyone should be aware of on a very, very hard, high level? Uh, in the last 20 years, or all the time that I've been doing with security, weak passwords and all kinds of a lack of security hygiene is the biggest problem ever. Uh, we talk about passwords all the time. We have implemented a lot of improvements to that but at the end of the day both new users experienced users everyone they got hit by password attacks and with the kind of a development of technology they become more and more sophisticated so it's not only that you have a password from one to six or a password which is called password uh, or the password that is incorrect as in the old meme on security so it's uh, different combinations of that, but in, in the kind of a nutshell, it's about lack of security hygiene and using the basic rules that you can either read online, either get from the security teams in your organization. So it's about very, very simple uh, human factor related security hygiene things. Um, second, uh, we've just installed our system. We configured it in some way, and in three days it got hacked. Um, th there can be different reasons for that, but once we use the up-to-date software, the most and we have designed it properly, the most common case is a lack of configuration or mm, improper configuration or just not doing the full deployment to, to the end. So it means that... Uh, with the complexity of the modern systems, the more complex environment you have, the bigger chance of doing something wrong or not fulfilling all the security requirements is the kind of a bigger, bigger, big, bigger problem. So we try to make the HS2 as easy to install as possible and to ensure that safe security defaults are always in place. So uh, the the only solution here is to study a lot about how to deploy systems and to uh, not overcomplicate things once you discuss your deployments and plan your deployments. The third most uh, common thing is outdated software, lack of updates. There were some discussions about it, but running legacy software is always uh, almost a bad idea. And uh, in the last two years, this uh, approach got um, kind of extra flavor. Um, there is a term which is called software su supply chain. Uh, and uh, it means that not only your software that you run DHS2 on may be vulnerable, but all the dependencies, all the components that were used to build this software, they can be also vulnerable. And if you update the package itself, there is no guarantee that the dependencies that were included in this package, software package application, they were um, not vulnerable. So in our case, we have an automated process of developing and checking all the dependencies for DHS2. But if you use a operating system or database with some uh, other or dependencies that were not checked, you're potentially at risk. So the attackers are always trying to find the weakest uh, part in this chain and uh, the weakest element in this chain and it means that if they are not able to attack your system they will be tr looking for the vulnerable parts of the supply chain to attack them and uh, the last uh, case is uh, poorly designed or developed software uh, including the same supply chain so if you are using some technologies to deploy systems on uh, that are poorly designed or have lack of security controls. It means that even if you use a very secure software, the under underlying la layers are at risk. 
Um, I've been talking to one of the NGOs in Norway last week, and they told me that they had invested a lot of time and resources in building security uh, of their systems. But um, as they were running a lot of different applications and people in different countries where they operate had a lot of um, different technology stacks, it, uh, the effort was not worth that because they simply did not uh, cover all the underlying layers and uh, the design decisions that were made by people in different countries were not always good from security. So whatever they built on the top of that was uh, not secure just because of the vulnerabilities in the underlying platform. So um, holistic approach to security always wins. So it's not an easy, easy thing to do at once. So after talking about motivation, after talking about uh, impact uh, and failing to uh, reach the organizational goals, uh, the remaining component is likelihood. And uh, for example, if we try to do some kind of the risk management uh, for banking or insurance, they've been doing it for hundreds of years. And uh, there are really good mathematical statistical models. And you can predict the likelihood of su such event, or you can predict the likelihood of the uh credit score or the reputation of the loan or, or many other things uh, related on the case of foreign insurance uh, based on the very very proven mathematical models this is not the case for security yet so uh, if we look at the history of the whole uh, cyber sec um i think the first quantitative efforts uh, the quantitative model for security appeared uh, i think in 1990 or 1993, and uh, we are still not there yet, although we have a lot of data since then. So most of the approaches, they are very, very qualitative. So we talk about the exposure of the systems to the internet. So if you have anything connected to internet, there are high chances to that it is hacked. Uh, if you run outdated software, there are high chances that it is hacked. If you don't have a really good understanding of security within your organization, it is also kind of a signal that something bad can happen. So there are a lot of criteria that we, we can discuss it more details uh, uh, during the next session or uh, outside of this session rooms. But in general, uh, we try to select the most important criteria based on the quali uh, qualitative assessment. This is what shows the real attitude to security. So when everything breaks, there is someone who says, okay, there is no problem to that. And uh, these are common explanations to that. I am pretty sure that you've, you've heard them from someone in your organizations. Mm, we don't have budget. We don't have time. We don't have skills. And uh, it looks like Security is not a priority for many, although the amount of security incidents and the severity and the impact of the incident, it grows from year to year. So for like the statistics that we have from 2022, uh, this year's is not available yet, but uh, like I think that every third organization in the world had a security incident. So it means that in this room, there is a likelihood that one third of people, for example, this row, uh, had faced a security issue or will face a security issue for this year as an as a organization. So it's quite a lot and it's growing. And the big problem is that, that attackers, they see more and more value of the user data or the cyber attacks and it becomes much more profitable for them to attack. So it means that the uh, the stakes, uh, stakes are growing and we have more and more problems. And uh, we're still not there yet because we don't, we really don't have enough awareness and uh, sufficient knowledge because it's kind of a not very trivial domain to understand. And for example, if we look at general physical safety, 
I think like when driving a car, many people use seat, seat belts or safety belts, or if you go to the airport and go for security checks, um, it's very different to what was in the air industry or the car industry 50 years ago. So I assume that in some years we'll come to the same state where we go through the scans or we use some belts or similar similar things uh, in the security domain. But in general, we don't understand the like impact and the severity of risk that happen. And once we don't understand them, uh, we don't make a proper risk assessment. Uh, and our risk appetite is too optimistic. Uh, and uh, we are more on the incident mitigation side rather than on the incident prevention side. And what happens is the perception changes. So people think more about security, but typically it is based on the incident follow-up rather than on prevention measures. So this is exactly what we're going to change together. We're trying to encourage you to think more about cybersecurity and to educate your peers, educate your colleagues, and to grow, grow the security awareness and knowledge within their organization. So what can be improved? The first, everything starts from the top. And it is important to raise security awareness on the executive level. And uh, the like the biggest justification for that is we would like to uh, not to report our managers about the ongoing crisis, but we would like to report them that we have prevented that or we know how to prevent the potential crisis. And it means that before doing anything, we need some management commitment, we need some management support and management understanding that it is important. And um, otherwise we'll be just mitigating one incident after another. And it uh, is a kind of a painful, uh, low, uh, effective way of doing things. The second is making proper risk assessment and risk choices. And it's about agreeing what is the impact and what are priorities. The third thing is having clear ownership of data and systems within the organizations in the same manner as someone owns all the physical assets and in the same manner as there are people responsible for teams, uh, for team management, for all kinds of the physical assets and the processes and other things. And it's about assignment of roles and the responsibilities based or related to the ownership. This list can be extended, and this is a very, very uh, like high level thing. It is something that we start with, but uh, there is a huge layer of technical and practical security happening once we get to the once we get the management support or once we get to the technical deployment. And this is what we are going to talk about in the next session uh, about DHS2 security practices, about hardening DHS2, about compliance, uh, make, making compliance easy, and answering your questions also. That's all from me. If you have any follow-up questions now, please ask. Okay, thank you for your presentations. I'm Intan from Indonesia. I have two questions for you. Uh, has the HIS to receive ISO uh, certifications, 27,000? Like, because they're so very important for me. Mm -hmm. uh, in the next years, we have uh, certifications of 27 uh, ISO, uh, just like a standardization from our government to connect the system of populations data. So this is one question. And uh, uh, the second is, what is the differences between ISO 27,000 ones and 30,000 that you uh, said before how to uh, risk management approach? Mm -hmm. You use uh, 
thirty thousands yeah. for the ISO. What is the difference uh, between uh, two types ISO? Because I know about the ISO twenty seven thousands one. There is a uh, approach of the risk management. So, what is the differences between two types? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Great, great questions. Um, let's start with the first one. So, DHS two does not have ISO twenty seven thousand certification because it does not apply to the software. So, ISO twenty seven thousand is a information security management systems compliance, and it tells about how organizations uh, are or should be compliant or should be managing their security in accordance with the best practice, with the standards. So it means that once you come to the software, there should be some different standard that applies. Um, if we look at the ISO 27000, there is a, a chapter that is related to the software systems development where you uh, describe how your organization acquires or develops software. And this is the only part where you can find some kind of a um, connection or some compliance requirements that may apply to us. Um, if we talk about general requirements like uh, logging, like access control and password policy, uh, DHS2 supports them, but it is always up to the implementation, right? So it's how you configure the system uh, rather than what software can do. So in short, um, the standard itself doesn't apply. We would say that for the software applications, mm, there are some better standards for that, uh, like OWASP standards to describe security in the products. But if you would like to find some mapping between DHS2 and ISO requirements, uh, there is an application uh, software development and acquisition. There is access control, logging, and typical things that should be implemented in the organizations include for all the systems, including DHS2. And if you have some specific requirements on how to address in DHS2, we can take it for the next session discussion to go into details and see uh, these mappings. Um, in addition to that, uh, uh, there is a really good website. I'll share a link in the document a bit later, um, uh, which uh, makes a compliance mapping between different standards. For example, I saw NIST, uh, all kind of French uh, NS, NS, uh, A and uh, SSI and other standards. So if you are compliant with one or would like to have some requirements that, uh, in alignment with one standards, you can see, for example, how it matches all, all the others. And it's really helpful to navigate through this kind of the uh, set of the different requirements. We use it internally also when we check if there is anything that matches and that applies to our our environment. So that's it. Um, but I agree that there can be specific cases where you should consider how the system is implemented to uh, ensure compliance with ISO 27000. Right? Uh, internally for our organizations, we didn't consider that because uh, we are um, developing software and to, in order to um, establish some secure software development process, we need a bit more detailed standard than ISO, and we are like aiming for compliance with these standards as well, like OWASP standards. Second question, the difference between ISO 27000 and ISO 31000. So as a, as I mentioned, uh, 27000 is information security management system standards, and it talks about information security. 31,000 is a risk management standard with, which tells how an organization can manage all kinds of risks, including security risks. And for some historical reason, the definition of risk sits in ISO 31,000 standard rather than in ISO 27, but they, uh, the ISMI standard, it refers to uh, ISO 31,000, uh, so they kind of harmonize with that. So if you are required to do some risk management, 
uh, as a general organizational practice to have a registry of risks for your organization, for a minister and so on, uh, you can look into the ISO 31000 because it has a, it has a really good guidance uh, on that. Uh, and you can apply these uh, risks to the general organization risks, to the policy risks, to the compliance risks, and to security risks as well. And the last addition, it's a new, relatively new standard and it's actively developed. So it's good for like use because it's quite new and considering a lot of insecurity area. I see someone from the back row willing to ask a question. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Um, I'm just, I'm actually just relaying a message from the document that you shared that I think would be a really great thing for, for us to talk about here today. Uh, the question, I'm just going to read it directly because I think it's pretty good. Is any, is, is there any security document available for DHIS2? Uh, do you do any pad testing? Is there any other testing that's done? And are there any security standards that DHIS2 comply with, which maybe, maybe was talked about a little bit already? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, have I think it, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. I have it open here. So okay, thank perfect. You, thank you for reading. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, many questions in one and uh, really good that they were asked. So, security document uh, available for DHS2. So everything that we do uh, as an open source is public. So we have two web pages. I'll write them in the document later. It's uh, dhs2.org slash security. It explains security features of the product. And the second one is dhs2.org slash trust. And it explains how we do security. And uh, the high level explanation of our security approach is on the second link, dhs2.org slash trust. Um, for pen testing, uh, it's a bit more complicated because um, dhs2 is open source and everyone can download and install software. So it means that if we test something, we can get a radically different result from what you test in your environment. And uh, for example, when someone sends us pen testing uh, reports from the field, we see that 80, roughly 80% 80 of the vulnerabilities found, they are not related to DHS2, but they are related to the specific implementations and configuration issues or software security issues in that, configura in, in that installations. So it means that uh, what we can do is to have a reference setup of DHS2 and make a pen, pen testing report on that. So we did it internally for the current release and we are going to make it uh, public in the next months to have something available, but it will say uh, some estimates about our security level for our own setup. So for your implementations, we always recommend to have your own penetration test because they will consider your features installed, how it is configured in your environment. And uh, for us, we always uh, love to receive uh, penetration testing reports. And if we see something important there that is relevant to DHS2, we definitely consider proof and put into the bug fixes as well. As you can see, they some, have some security uh, components and changes there. So for other te testing done, we do security scanning of the code, uh, source uh, source code uh, with the public tools and we have public dashboards. I'll share the link for your reference uh, for the next session. And uh, we do security audit of every new big release uh, as for now, starting from the last version we released. And uh, for the standards, I think I answered that, but we are aiming to comply with the or WASP uh, web and mobile application security standards and the uh, software assurance maturity model, which is most relevant one for security teams and software teams. Yes. I'm going to touch something around the data disclosure agreements, data sharing agreements. About what? 
Are we going to touch something around data sharing agreements, non-disclosure agreements? Uh, we have uh, we have one as a template uh, that was uh, created uh, roughly three four weeks ago. And we can talk about this in the next uh, session because it's a kind of a specific use case. But yeah, we have a, a suggested form of the uh, data sharing agreements that, you, that DHS to implementers and uh, uh, contractors uh, that support the system can use with some security component included. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. So we'll um, end the session there. Just a reminder that Michael has a dedicated session on security, and he's, of course, here for the next couple of days. Please feel free to uh, reach him, uh, reach out to him and, and speak to him. Um, but of course, he has a dedicated session where he'll get into more details. So I think Penwood has a quick announcement. Right. So uh, tea is ready outside. Uh, but just before you break for tea, three, no three announcements. So the first thing is, uh, I again urge all of you, please join the WhatsApp group. Uh, because we we always communicate uh, everything in that WhatsApp group. So uh, in case, because like we have one more um, city tour plan for today. So if you are not in the uh, WhatsApp group, then you may miss important messages. So please do that. And secondly, <clears throat> about the Google form that we have shared in the WhatsApp group, only 80 people have submitted so far. So we have around 25 missing. Uh, so unfortunately, if you don't submit it by this, uh, I mean, by today noon, we might not be able to share with you the uh, certificates and other documents uh, before, uh, I mean, by, by the end of the week. Uh, and finally, about the pe uh, for the people who have paid us on site, the registration fee, you will be receiving a soft copy of the receipt uh, during the day. In case if you don't receive it by tomorrow morning, please uh, meet our team at the registration desk and let us know. That's it. Thank you. So please, we, we are breaking for tea and uh, we start. Yeah, please, if you uh, will uh, come back at 11 uh, a.m. and we'll have continue with our country presentations. We do have quite a few today, so we just want to be on time. So we'll start back with our colleagues from Libya. So uh, please enjoy your break. Thank you. Sri Lanka, Lonely Planet Destination of the Year 2019, beautiful, vibrant, and soon to be seen through some very different eyes, those of his exotic wildlife. From the crystal blue waves of the Indian Ocean, where giants gather together along the sandy beaches of Gaul, home to newly hatched turtles, through the temples of Polonnaruwa to meet cheeky locals, and to the highlands seen for the first time from an eagle's eye. Sri Lankan Wildlife presents So Majestic, So Playful, so vibrant. So Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. Lonely Planet Destination of the Year 2019. Beautiful, vibrant, and soon to be seen through some very different eyes those of his exotic wildlife. From the crystal blue waves of the Indian Ocean, where giants gather together, along the sandy beaches of Gaul, home to newly hatched turtles, through the temples of Polonnaruwa to meet cheeky locals, and to the highlands seen for the first time from an eagle's eye. Sri Lankan Wildlife presents So majestic, so playful, so vibrant, 
So, Sri Lanka. <laughs>